I'm going to introduce you to Jim Widenar. So Jim uh, is somebody that I've, Jim, it was a few years ago that we met. Um, I know you had come to West Michigan and in your role as kind of the, in church equipping through Harvest USA, you were meeting with, with, with church leaders and church pastors and, and such. I know you had worked with Tom Grolsma from First CRC and Byron Center. So that was the first connection that I had officially to you. But Jim is working at Harvest USA and I'm gonna let him tell us a little bit more about Harvest USA and what, what their work is, but they, they're based out of Philadelphia, but Jim works out of Pittsburgh. And they do a lot of work, lots of, in providing resources to churches and to individuals to minister to those who are struggling with sexual sin and temptation. And so we're gonna be walking through some of that together this afternoon. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this time. And Jim, we've been talking about this for, for a while. And so I'm excited that you're here and that we have a chance to ask you some questions, but also that you get to kind of show us uh, some of the stuff that has been helpful in your ministry that could be helpful to us as well too. So welcome. Thank you. Um, let me just say it's privileged to do this. Um, I was uh, born and raised in the CRC and uh, growing up, I, I came to Christ under the ministry of, of Joel Boot at, in Dearborn, Dearborn CRC mm -hmm. in Michigan and uh, Calvin College, Calvin Seminary, at, at least a couple people who come into these meetings at one point in the last few weeks have emailed me and said, hey, do you remember me? I, and so it's possible that in the in the list of people that are here that there's somebody who knows me or somebody that I know. And uh, hello, if that's the case, I can't see everybody who's here. Um, you can send me an email later. It's always nice to reconnect uh, with friends. I was at Calvin Seminary from 1990 or so until 95. I, it's always a little fuzzy when I when I arrived and when I left. Um, it's a long time ago. It's the, the, you know, the last century. Okay, so yeah. let me just introduce uh, myself. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do basically three sections here. I, I have a three-part sermon, so to speak, uh, with alliteration, meat, model, and ministry. So we'll start first with the meat, which is uh, a chance for me to introduce uh, myself, my story, and Harvest USA. So I told you a little bit my, about myself, born in in um, in Grand Rapids, at uh, what used to be Blodgett, uh, raised in the east side of the state, Calvin College, Calvin Seminary, um, met my uh, my wife to be while I was uh, just before I started coming to Calvin Seminary, and you need to know a little bit about of my story in terms of uh, why I ended up here at Harvest. I was I was someone who, while I was uh, committed in my faith from a very young age, I also developed a, a, a very serious pornography habit. And that was with me as a secret struggle until I was engaged to be married and about to start seminary. So under the conviction of the spirit, which is the, the best way to come forward with something like that, I decided I needed to be uh, straightforward and honest with uh, my fiance I went to confess to her and and did so and that was a very traumatic event um, did almost end our relationship and without giving you details the biggest the most the most relevant detail about that whole experience was that uh, my my now wife Deb was able to reveal to me some some quite serious wounds that she had that were connected uh, to these issues connected to pornography and in such a way that my heart was broken and suddenly what had been an embarrassment and a sense of shame for myself was transformed into pure conviction of sin and I suddenly understood how incredibly hateful my, my lust and my sin was, how destructive it was, how destructive it had been throughout my life, how destructive it was to her. And so it became an issue of, of more genuine repentance 
uh, at a deeper level and repentance that I have uh, continued to push deeper into my heart um, and parts of my life uh, to this day. It's been a dominant uh, issue in terms of uh, our relationship and formed me deeply, formed a lot of what I studied at Kelvin Seminary, formed a lot of what I studied in my dissertation at Westminster. So that was what brought me to Harvest USA. The other thing that it did is it, it gave me a deep humility. After that time, God brought into my life in, in many ways at many times, uh, friends and acquaintances who were either identifying as gay or had same-sex attraction and were not identifying that way. And what I found was having that experience of repentance myself, I was able to... Um, to come at those relationships with a deep humility and a sense of commonality and a sense of, of I never was shocked or disgusted or put off uh, by those friends and acquaintances. I, I always had a deep sense of I'm actually a worse sinner. And uh, I, I totally understand what's going on, even though my particular issue was not same sex. Doesn't this do oh, just forget the ice. Can yeah. Remind everybody to, to uh, go on the right up right of your screen and hit the little mute button if you can. Um, if you if you come in. So that prepared me for uh, working at Harvest USA. A little history of Harvest USA. It was started in 1983. Um, out of 10th Presbyterian Church in uh, Center City, Philadelphia. Originally, it was begun at that time as an outreach to the homosexual community in Philadelphia. Uh, the steps of the church were a, a, a pickup spot for gay prostitutes, um, especially on Sunday evenings. And the church decided, uh, rather than just you know doing the real angry conservative thing and telling them to get away from our church, uh, let's let's start a Bible study and see if they'll come. Um, from the beginning, it was very gospel focused. Um, let's see if I have. So from the beginning, the, the the approach was not therapeutic. It was not psychological. It was not viewing this as something something to fix in that way. It was it was viewed as something that was. Uh, that was deeply connected to the problem we all have, which is sin and the gospel. And so with a reformed understanding of, of humanity, a reformed understanding of sin, that we're all corrupted, uh, we all have a nature that um, has a natural tendency to hate God and neighbor, uh, that, is, that is corrupted in, in, all, in all kinds of ways, in our thoughts, in our feelings, our affections, our emotions, uh, and that the gospel speaks to that that the gospel of Jesus Christ um, definitively changes us, places us in Christ, and throughout our life helps us to make progress, progressive sanctification towards all of our sin, not necessarily taking away temptations or taking away any struggles, but nevertheless giving us progress. So with that kind of gospel, Harvest USA very quickly um, found itself appealing to sexuality issues that were broader than, than just homosexuality. And so I think within a year or two, uh, people started coming to Harvest USA with, with just heterosexual pornography or adultery issues, uh, wives of strugglers, et cetera, parents. And so we, we developed a, 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 broader, a broader perspective. And then at some point, uh, Harvest USA uh, realized that we needed to not try to do this ourselves, but to equip the church to do it so that we began to uh, make the second focus of our work to be putting our minds, putting our, heart, our, our, our faces towards the church and seeking to produce resources and materials to help the church do what we were doing in our small groups and one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, so that's uh, one of the distinctives. The other that has always marked Harvest USA is a firm commitment to the both and of truth and mercy. And I know it is easy. We've seen it all in, in many places, falling off on one side or the other, emphasizing truth to the extent that we are, we are orthodox, but cold and powerless 
and just angry conservatives or emphasizing mercy to the point where we compromise truth and it all falls apart on that side. And we're committed and we have to keep reminding ourselves that these are not contradictory ideas that in Christ, in God, they, they hold together and we need to hold them together and we can't let go of either one. And so that's been um, a solid distinctive of Harvest USA since its founding. Now let's look at the model. Um, what I'm gonna show you is the, the model that we've developed to, uh, to help guide how we work with in what we call direct ministry, meaning when we're helping individuals and we call this the tree model. The tree model comes from uh, the biblical idea of uh, really Jesus describing us as trees. You know, a, a good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit, etc. And putting that together with what the Bible says about the heart. Uh, Jesus telling us that it's not what goes into the mouth that makes a man unclean, but what comes out of him that makes him unclean, because what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and it's out of the heart that come adultery, uh, slander, uh, evil thoughts, etc. So we are trying to, to take those concepts, the idea of thinking of the human as a tree that produces fruit, and we're trying to connect that with the idea, the biblical idea, that everything we do comes ultimately from a, a deep place inside us that is not always visible, where our, our thoughts and affections reside and our true worship happens. And out of that place comes what we recognize as fruit, the things that we do. Someone coming into my office uh, to deal with a, a, a habit of pornography or um, issue with homosexuality, they have a particular behavior or a problem that is the presenting issue that they're hoping I'll help them with. And my job in discipling them is to help them apply the gospel, not just to that fruit, but to a much deeper level in their heart. And so that's what we're trying to picture uh, using the tree. So the fruit, as I've just begun describing, is, is the presenting issue. And it's usually one particular presenting issue that is for some reason or another, more problematic than all the other bad fruit that's happening in our lives all the time. Um, so we want to go beyond that. And to start, we'll begin at the seed. And, and we're going to make the seed of the tree represent the biblical idea of the heart. Uh, it's very tricky to define exactly the biblical concept of heart. It, it's as you know, it's all over the scriptures. It encompasses a lot. A um, little bit further on, I'll describe the heart in its, in its two main actions as, as the thoughts of the mind and the affections of the heart. Um, but for now, for these purposes, we want to not go even that specifically. We want to just talk about the heart as that mysterious, deepest level of commitment and worship. And the important point about that is that in our understanding from the Bible, that heart is fallen, that heart is corrupted. And the word that Harvest USA likes to use for that is autonomy, um, self-rule. Uh, we have decided that we are, we are the kings, we are the queens of the universe, and uh, we don't need God. Um, we're going to do it on our own. Um, that autonomy is the basic engine that causes everything else that happens in the tree. Uh, after the heart or the seed, we're gonna talk about the soil. And when we talk about soil, we're talking about circumstances, uh, environment, context. This is everything outside of you or everything about you that is, that is objective and not a product of your heart acting. So it's your family, the, the family you're born into, um, how, how big it is, how small it is. Um, is, it a, is it a traditional family? Is it a broken family? Um, the dynamics of that family. It could be... Um, oh, my God. 
it, it could be if you have a, a it could be good things and it could be bad things it could be that you had a very stable family um loving family christian family you could be growing up in a very non-christian family there could be uh, trauma and abuse going on in that family there could be alcoholism etc um all these things that happen in family dynamics your peers your friends um if you have friends or if you don't have friends how your friends treat you how how your other peers treat you are you bullied growing up are you are you popular growing up um what is what is the way that you relate that that people relate to you uh, do they do they treat you well do they treat you poorly what is your economic status those kinds of things what about you know health and those uh those types of issues that experiencing great sickness experiencing other types of, of suffering in your life all this soil these these things around you um, that are happening to you both good and bad are and this is the one of the key things about the soil is that it is it is influential but not determinative and what we mean by that is we want to take your story seriously we want to hear what's been going on we want to hear what's happened to you what's what's your environment and we're going to take that seriously as a, a, a significant influence upon you but we're always going to keep in mind that whatever is happening around you to you your heart is actively interacting with that your heart as an autonomous uh soul in rebellion against god like it or not is interpreting what's going on in a certain way and so what's what happens to us and what's around us doesn't make us act a certain way it doesn't make us become something although it, it is something that we need to, to to listen to carefully because it, it has great effect on us uh, uh, just an example of this you all are aware of uh, johnny erickson tata and uh, part of her soil was that she had this diving accident when she was a teenager was paralyzed uh, in most of her body and that has dominated her her experience of of this life and yet we see where her heart went with that and how her heart handled that um, my former colleague had an acquaintance growing up who was in a similar diving accident at, near the same era as johnny erickson tata and he ended up hiring dr death to help him commit suicide different outcome different direction same soil and that's a that's a very extreme example but it, it i think it, it illustrates quite poignantly uh what i'm trying to say there so we want to take the soil seriously we want to take the context of the experiment the experience seriously but we want to hold that in 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 the context of of the heart so now looking at the activity of the heart we're going to talk first about the roots and i like to think of the roots as as reaching out for nutrients into the soil and so the roots represent the affections of the heart or the desires of the heart and we're not talking about desires here that on a very daily petty uh sense of i want new golf clubs or i want uh, what i want for dinner we're talking about i want to to know that i'm significant I want to uh, to be safe. I want to be loved. I want affirmation. I want friendship. I want intimacy. I want uh, I want peace with people. I want peace with God. Uh, these are big, deep, broad heart desires that we're talking about in the roots. Now, what I want you to think about when you think about those heart desires reaching out into our environment is that originally as created, if you go before the fall in Genesis 1 and 2, these deep heart desires would have been fulfilled abundantly at God's hand. He would have given us all of these things. So you can almost think of anything that I listed, uh, the sense of of significance and value 
created in the image of God, um, what can be more significant than that? What can be more valuable than that? Knowing that you had the love and care of the creator of the universe, um, safety and security, again, protected in the garden, in the father's care, uh, perfectly. Um, one, of the, one of the desires that we often talk about at Harvest USA is the desire for control. And there is a desire for control that God would have given us, that the desire to have an appropriate level of control over our environment. And he gave us dominion over the whole earth. And so he was, he was offering us that th those desires that he created us with would be fulfilled. Uh, desire for, for intimacy, not only with God, but with others. It is not good for man to be alone. That's not a verse about marriage. It's a verse about whether God would have one human on the earth or whether God would have a, an earth that is filled with humans and society. And he said, I want an earth filled with humans and society. He's going to give us social interaction and friendship and community. And with that comes intimacy leading up to the, the wonderful intimacy of marriage uh, that many would experience, all pointing, and especially marriage, pointing to a greater intimacy that we were to have with him, um, all pointing to, in some way or form, the tree of life and the new heavens and the new earth and perfect communion in the church, in Christ's body, with him and with the Lord. So all of that would have been given us. But what happens when we rebel in Adam and Eve, and all of us, all of us follow in this nature, is that rather than receiving the, all of these blessings from God as the, the blesser with a capital B, we, we decide that we can do it ourselves. We cut the blesser with a capital B out of the picture, but we don't stop seeking those blessings. We continue wanting those blessings. The problem is we're wanting them autonomously, apart from the blesser, in our own way, and we're wanting them in a soil that has now, because of our sin, been cursed. So we are dealing with uh, other sinners and sin broken, a sin broken world where, where bad things happen. And so these desires are continually thwarted and we find ourselves suffering under the loss of these blessings. Um, nevertheless, we will, in our sinful hearts, we will find some things, the enemy will make sure that we find in the soil, in our experiences, some things that at least counterfeit those blessings of God that he was, that he was giving us. And we will grab onto those counterfeits, and we will go to those counterfeits over and over and over again, just because uh, that's the best we can do. If we're going to be cut off from God, the best we can do is find something that approximates those, those desires and those blessings that, that we should have had uh, from him. But of course, the Bible calls most of those pursuits sin, and we, we, we do them in ways that are uh, not in accord with the way that he wants us to find them. And so sexuality is in that realm. Um, what are you the world is all too eager to give us ways to experience sexuality that are something other than the one person committed uh, monogamous se sexuality that God designed for us to have as a picture of Christ in the church. And we find it in many other ways. So that's the roots. Um, what do you look now at the other the, the roots? If the roots are the heart that's what we desiring and, things, then the trunk is the heart thinking things. It's no, the it's mindset, no. it's the what functional. Did, what did we do worldview. now? What we did now. The functional worldview what? is um yeah, I'm, just, I'm going to hold on. There's a couple of folks that are talking through. Can you uh, mute yourself? That would be great. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. So the trunk is our functional worldview, not, not our stated theology. It's not uh, what, you would, what you would answer on a, on a test or if you were being interviewed by a session or a presbytery. It is, it is what you really believe revealed in what you do. 
And uh, this is, when we're working with individuals, this is one of the most difficult and tricky things to get at because we don't, we don't like it when we realize what we really believe, what's really driving our actions. It's, it's pretty shocking. Um, the trunk uh, also doesn't move very much. If you've, if you've ever run into a tree, uh, it, it hurts. Uh, the, tree doesn't, the tree doesn't go anywhere. It's hard to change this. So also our functional worldview, the, the, uh, the interpretive grid, the, the unstated, unconscious, and yet daily functional interpretive grid that we use even emotionally to respond to what's going on around us and to guide us in our decisions, it doesn't change easily. It changes slowly over time and it's, and it's a painful process. Uh, we're talking about false beliefs about God, false beliefs about ourselves, false beliefs about others. Uh, so we might find ourselves believing about God that either, you know, maybe, maybe we don't believe that he's really there, that he really sees what we're doing. If you think about somebody who is uh, secretly pursuing some kind of, of, of sexual pursuit or sexual sin, what's implied in that is the belief that God's not here watching me. He doesn't see me. Uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that I, I functionally, I believe that uh, believing that God doesn't, doesn't love me. God is not God is not for me. Um, this is this is part of the whole the whole autonomy and rebellion of the heart in saying I'm going to do this on my own. And this is part of what we see in Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. Is this saying He is not going to be sufficient? He is not going to give us what we need. His instructions are not going to work. I, I'm going to do better if I if I find this my way. Uh, that's an unstated belief that we have to confront. And confess. It could be um, beliefs about myself, like uh, I believe that I am worthless, or I believe I'm um, a failure. Some of that, you know, maybe you failed at certain things, but you're fundamentally believing that there is nothing good in you. And again, you can see how this comes from cutting ourselves off from God as the blesser with a capital B. So these lies all have to be recognized and repented of and brought to the gospel. So how does the gospel, first of all, come into the tree? So usually at this point, if I'm helping someone to understand this and I'm drawing it on a piece of paper, I'll draw a little cross next to the tree. And the first arrow that I will draw from the cross will be towards the heart. And I want to make two points to this person. I want to say Romans 8.1, and I want to say Romans 8.32. So Romans 8.1 is the first part of the um, what we call the duplex gratia, the double grace. That is forgiveness, justification. There is, there is in Christ no condemnation for those who are in Christ, no condemnation. And so the way we apply that is as someone begins to to look into their experiences and see their heart and see their heart's desire and recognize how these desires, though, though they're wanting okay, yeah. something that is, that is good yeah. in and of itself, that these desires are being pursued in a way that is, that is apart from God. That is something to be recognized and to be brought to the cross. And forgiveness is to be received for that in faith. Uh, but the next thing well, and you need you do that not only with the roots, you do that with the trunk as well. You do that with your with your thought processes. The next thing is also uh, Romans eight thirty two, which I'll paraphrase something like: If if God did not spare His own Son, how will He not also give us all things? And I see this as a restoration to the relationship of blesser with a capital B to a bless E. So God is calling us in the gospel to once again receive by faith everything that he wants to give us. Um, some here and now in our present by faith relationship with Christ, but, but many in the form of promises that we have uh, for the future. And so that's a, that's a process of recognizing uh, what these beliefs are and what these desires are and saying, I need to understand 
from the scriptures, how does God reorient those desires? How does God help me to find gospel promises that meet those desires? And what this should do is this should, this should dry up the sap that is running to the fruit or to, to the sins. See, because under normal, un, unaddressed, what happens is you attack the fruit with um, resolutions, willpower, a surface type of accountability where you're just meeting with people and confessing what you did. And you might for a time have success at that. But because you've never dealt with anything that's underneath it, it just comes back again. Every time you, you get into the wrong circumstance or the right circumstances, you might think it, um, the right circ uh, sequence of events what I would call a trigger type of event, which is the branches of the tree, the fruit's going to be there again. It's going to happen. Uh, Paul David Tripp calls this apple stapling, where you take the, the bad apples off the tree and you staple good apples on the tree, and it just doesn't work. You need to change the, the, the tree itself. So uh, another way that we think of the gospel as affecting this is that uh, when you are joined to Christ, he gives you a new heart, of course, removes your heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, and you are grafted into his tree. You're grafted onto, into a new tree. You have this new heart, but you still have, in our experience, we still have the old experiences, the old tree, the old habits, all these habits of our heart, all our habits of our mind, these things need to be addressed. And so even when we have our renewed heart in union with Christ, we have a lifetime of learning to address our sins at the level of our, of our thoughts and the level of our, of our desires. And we do that by recognizing sin, recognizing the fruit, not, not ignoring the fruit, but seeing the fruit as the, the marker of where we need to follow it down into the tree to find out what's deeper. Um, that's how we that's the process of working through applying this. So a um, couple other things, actually, I'm going to go back to that. A couple other points I want to say about this tree. This is, and I think this is especially important as you're thinking about homosexuality and same-sex attraction. This is, this is not intended as a, uh, as a reparative therapy model. This is not intended, first of all, to give, to give a, a, a clear um, diagnosis for why someone feels the way they do, why they struggle a particular way they do. It does help someone understand, but it's not, this is not about finding the definitive source of homosexuality. There's a recognition here of a complexity that is very deep. So I think we need to be, be careful with that. Um, recognizing in the tree that we as people are complicated and this resists simplistic diagnoses. It just, it just does, it resists simplistic diagnoses. Um, the next thing about it is that the tree model encourages a broad and multifaceted approach to change. Um, change is always conceived of as moving from sin to holiness by faith in Christ, not not as some would want to in, in the issue of homosexuality, not seeing it as like a toggle switch from, from homosexuality to heterosexuality, as if you're going to you know, switch your orientation. This is saying, this is much more complicated than that, and much broader than that. If, if you are doing this out of um, a heart experience, a heart desire for, say, uh, control and affirmation because of ways you've, you've re responded to experiences, that is going to affect not just the way you express and seek your sexuality, that's going to express a lot of the way you treat people in life. And your repentance is going to reach all your areas of life, not even just your area of sexuality. So you wanna use the tree model in a way that really gives a broad and multifaceted direction uh, for repentance. And the third thing I wanna say is the tree model gives place for listening to suffering. 
in someone's life. We want to take seriously that everyone who is a sinner, and we all are, is also a sufferer. And we do not, we do not deal with the sin without also addressing the suffering. And when we look at the soil of the tree model, it's an opportunity for us to listen carefully to what someone has experienced. And very often, what we'll find is that I mean, you can apply this to almost any sin, but if you apply this to a sin that at first you don't understand and you think something like, I could never do that, I don't understand that at all, and you listen to someone, you listen to their experiences, you find, I understand that, I get that, I understand, given what's been going on and where you've been, how your heart is responding to this. I can't say that it's exactly right, I have to help you apply the gospel to it but I get it, and I have compassion on you because, because of that suffering. Um, so that is, that is the, the tree model. Um, now I want to talk a, a little bit further about what we have learned in helping churches to do this, and I'll, I'll do this uh, hopefully a little bit briefly, more briefly than the tree model, so we can get to Q&A. So I want to talk about church culture broadly, redemptive ministry, meaning helping individuals, and then give you some, some tools for that. So church culture, I put a, a breakfast photo here uh, because some of you may be aware of the uh, Peter Drucker quotation, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you, if you haven't heard that, you need to know that it's true. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, church culture is something that's going to change slowly, but is incredibly important. Uh, my wife and I were just discussing today our own church culture. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the issue of uh, evangelism and dealing with you know, when you bring people into the church that are really rough around the edges, uh, we're always a little bit nervous about if we bring this person in, is our church ready to love that person? And uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done before a church is able to move the, its attitude and it, its way of dealing with things. Um, so we need to work first on church culture and one of the guiding principles, again, is you need to have a culture of both truth and mercy, um, that both and. So truth. This is something that uh, many people who are in the Abide Project, I think, will, will find this fairly easy in terms of motivation. But you cannot, you cannot uh, compromise the truth. You must be basing uh, your understanding of the world and humans, and God, on what the scripture teaches. And I would say, in regard to sexuality, this means going deeper than the do's and don'ts. This, go, this means we need to challenge ourselves to seek to understand uh, the beautiful whole biblical theology, the positive biblical theology of sexuality, what it, what it positively means how it is that this is a profound mystery that shows us Christ and the church. Yes, sexuality is, because sexuality belongs to marriage. Marriage and sexuality are not separate in the creational worldview. They are, they are one, they're, 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 they're intimately connected. Um, and those realities picture Christ. So truth is a commitment to grow, not just having the right rules to tell our youth groups uh, which they're going to forget as soon as they leave, or sooner than that, uh, but to give ourselves and our children a positive biblical theology of sexuality. Very, very important and um, cannot be done. This, this all can't be done without changing the culture. And also a culture of, of mercy, a culture of grace. Now, a couple of things I want to say about that. Many of you are preachers or teachers, uh, when you preach or teach about sexuality, you need to ask yourself, are you more often in the mode of culture warrior, or are you more often in the mode of shepherd, gently tending 
herding and wounded sheep. And I think we need to get away from the culture war. And we need to start assuming that people in our congregations are struggling with these things, all types of things, all types of sexuality issues. Um, you, would, you would be very shocked if you could see how many were struggling with just pornography in your congregation, uh, much less many more things, as well as same-sex attraction, many who still are not, not daring to let anyone know. You need to preach as if they are in your congregation and you love them and you want them to find hope in the gospel and you want them to know that Jesus is there for people who know the brokenness of the fall. So you want to get away from culture war and get into preaching grace for them. If it's all culture war, someone who is secretly struggling, you know what they're thinking when they're shrinking in the pew and everyone else is thinking, yes, my pastor is finally preaching the truth against this culture. Those, those individuals are thinking, I'm the enemy. If anyone ever knew what I struggle with, they would know I'm the enemy. Uh, I'd be gone. They'd kick me out. And, and we don't want that. We want them to know that uh, we do believe that we're all broken, again, that commonality, and that we all find hope in the gospel, and the gospel does give hope. Um, also, in your preaching and teaching, you want to explore, biblically explore, the complexity of sin in such a way that emphasizes the commonality of our struggle. So, be careful about uh, preaching about sin in such a way that one particular sin struggle becomes the poster child for depravity. Uh, we need to help us all understand how we are more alike than different. And I think that if we look at the scriptures, honestly, the scriptures do that for us. They do that for us. Romans 1, a favorite passage to attack homosexuality. But if you look at the flow of Romans 1 and how Paul uses it in his argument, he is gently and almost, almost trickily, if that's a word, drawing his, his self-righteous readers into a list of sins, which includes things like disobedience to parents. And it gets he brings this to its climax at Romans 2, verse 1, which says, therefore, you, O man, have no excuse. Uh, so if we, are, if we are careful in how we exegete, it should be easy, if we're faithful to Scripture, to bring us all to the same level and recognize the complexity of sin, the depth of sin, and the commonality of sin. Um, that's another way uh, to create a culture of mercy and grace. Um, if you're in a teaching or preaching position. Um, the next thing, quickly, redemptive ministry, and by this I mean, how do, you, how do you actively in your church do the the type of ministry that is there to help people who are struggling? You have them in your church. You have people who are become disciplined cases. Um, you have people who are, are not disciplined cases yet because they haven't dared to confess. How do you create something a structure that helps them uh, to be able to do that. Uh, the overarching principle is you need to bring their sanctification uh, struggle into the power of Christian fellowship. You need, to, you need to bring them into the first John 1 type of fellowship in the light, uh, because that's really what sanctification requires for all of us, right? That is Without this, if we are trying to grow in our Christian life alone, without any honesty, without any accountability, without any friendship, without any praying for each other and building each other up and one another, there is no interaction with the body of Christ, and there is no growth. So in some sense, to say to bring them into the power of Christian fellowship is saying something obvious that is true of everyone, but it needs to be said for those who struggle sexually. It needs to be said because this, this, this whole category of sins especially is shrouded in darkness and shame and isolation. 
and the the pull will always be to hide the pull with with anyone whatever their struggle is same sex attraction or pornography or adultery or whatever it is the the impulse will be to not let anyone know so how do you do that in the broadest terms you start with one on one you start making sure that they know that there's at least one person who is willing and able to talk to them and they're not going to be uh they're not going to be wounded and paraded in front of the church as soon as they do that but there's one person who's going to graciously talk to them and then you move them gradually carefully to trust the goodness of god in his body enough to entrust their story and themselves and their struggle and their repentance to a safe group of people now it would be uh someone people often ask me well, well how wide should the living in the light be does it does everyone have to know everything about you and I, I don't think that's necessarily the case but you need to have enough enough people whom you with with whom you have fellowship on that level first john one type of fellowship that you are not stifling your growth in the lord and your sanctification and so uh, that's what we, in a nutshell, we try to encourage churches to do, set up a system where there's one person that people can come to, and then they can, they can learn the tree model, they can learn how to think about their repentance, they can start looking at their heart, their desires, their thoughts, and then they can move that into a group setting where they can be uh, loved on by others who have similar struggles and um, are not going to uh, condemn them, but welcome them to a gospel growth. Uh, quickly, some tools for that. Uh, these are just some things you, that Harvest USA can provide for you. There's many other uh, good organizations and ministries that have some tools. Um, first, some tools for culture formation. Uh, the first book uh, you see on the top there, God, You, and Sex, uh, we published that a couple years ago. That is, that is one of the best books that I know for beginning to build a positive biblical theology of sexuality. It's not just one of those books that tells you the do's and the don'ts, but it's a book that helps you to see how sexuality reveals to us the beauty and the love of God and the beauty of, of Christ's love for his church. There's uh, many other um, general books, Sunday school video series and whatnot on our site, uh, many, many books and pamphlets that you can make available. Uh, to your church to help shaping the to shape the thinking and the and the culture of your church and then there's tools for redemptive ministry uh, kind of our flagship redemptive ministry books are sexual sanity for men and sexual sanity for women um, these are both put together in a format that can either be used in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, series and i have used this one-on-one -on -one with people um, or it can be used in a group. We actually use sexual sanity for men in our introductory groups in our Philadelphia office. And then uh, the, the others that you see on there are uh, free digital downloads of curricula that go beyond those books. Uh, Shattered Dreams, New Hope is a curricula for parents whose adult children identify as LGBTQ+, um, and it's seeking to help them um, be an ambassador of the gospel to their children by continuing to love them and maintain relationship with them, um, pursuing them in love while not compromising the truth of, of the biblical standard of sexuality. Um, that's a that's a tall task, uh, very challenging, um, full of full of grief and faith. Um, Jesus and your unwanted journey is coming out in the summer. This summer, it's not yet ready, but that's for wives. Uh, particularly wives who have experienced betrayal from their husbands. Um, and then New Hope in Christ is a, a longer curriculum for men, uh, for a men's group, and it goes in detail through the tree model, uh, bringing them in a Bible study format through the tree model. So those are some, those are some tools. Um, Thank you. I mean, lots of great practical stuff here. So I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, right now, um, folks, if you have questions, this is the time to kind of throw them into the chat here. But a, a lot of good practical um, just information and just 
ways that we can um, minister to those within our congregations as well, too. So, Jim, one of the things that, that really stuck out to me, I mean, you just said this a couple of minutes ago, but talking about um, that First John 1 type of fellowship, you know, um, you know even myself, when I, when I hear you say that, I, 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 I cringe a little bit. And I think we all do because, you know, light exposes darkness, right? And, and it exposes what, it, it exposes our sin. Um, how, what have, I know you're talking about one-on-one, -on -one. what kind of things do have, have, have worked well one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, how does that look in a very practical, pragmatic way as you have worked with churches or where have you seen that be, be effective and then moving them to safe groups? I and mean, how does, just give us some more practical pieces of that. Right. So what, one of the issues with, with the one-on-one -on -one is the, someone who is struggling secretly with something is, is going to it's going to be a while it's going to take a long time to convince them and and right. prayer of the holy spirit again i, I said in my own story that the conviction of the spirit nobody was standing up there saying there's gospel hope for you it was yeah. the spirit saying you need to do this uh, so we we pray we pray for that to happen and and pray 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 in all mm -hmm. of this uh, lord forgive me for not saying that in this present right. Because apart from me, you can do nothing, is what Jesus says. So we, we can't do it without him. Um, but also, part of what you're praying for is that you would be able to gain the confidence of the people in the pew that there is someone who is safe mm -hmm. to talk to. There is someone that they, they know if they go and talk to this person, um, they're going to be loved. And And... Many people, some who have struggled with same-sex attraction, have tried to tell someone in the past, and it has gone very badly, very badly. And so they are, you know, once bitten, twice shy, and, and they're, they're going to, it's not going to be easy. So there needs to be at least someone, hopefully more than just one person, that they hear by the way they teach or preach or talk that this person is someone I can talk to. And they need, there needs to be a way for them to connect with that person that is confidential and secret. So uh, that needs to be communicated in some way. And then when someone comes, if you're, the, if you're that person and someone comes, you need to be, I mean, we have, we have, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about how to do this. Your, your main goal first is to make the person feel welcome, safe, to listen to ask a lot of questions, to be gracious, to make sure that they see in your, in your body language and in your environment that you're not, you're not disgusted at what you're hearing. You know, you, none of this, what? You did what? You know, none, none of that. You wanna be uh, unshockable and, um, and kind, asking a lot of questions, getting to know them and making sure that they know that that's part of the process. And then I think, Simply what I do, and in the first session I'm meeting with someone, I listen, I listen, I draw them out, I, I, I talk back to them in terms of repeating what they're saying and asking questions to make sure I understand. They want to know they're being heard. Um, and then I, at some point, I say, can I, can I explain to you where we're going to go with this? And I draw the tree model out on a piece of paper. I just draw it out and I explain it to them. And I try to help them see this is this is how we're going to help you. I want you to think about applying the gospel to your situation. Now, are you, you ready to meet with me some more and go through this book? That's basically what I do. And then at some point, um, prayerfully get their commitment to join the group, whatever, whatever group is going. Yeah, you know, um, it, it seems to be, you know, the, the, the necessity of fellowship of just, uh, of not just the surface fellowship, but but truly coming to know one another within the body of Christ, I mean, provides a foundation for, for the gospel work to happen. You yes. know, and, to, and that seems to be the, the uh, so important there. So I, I did throw, you, you, you wrote an article about the tree, I mean, you've written a lot about the tree yeah. model, but I, I just, I threw a link to that for everybody else's sake on the chat here. So if you'd like to see that, just have a tangible um, something to read, something to take away from this. I, it's in the chat here.
but I love that idea of just having something to write on a napkin, you know, when you're sitting across the table with somebody to help get an understanding. Because as we've talked about this, we know that, that, that issues of pornography and adultery and homosexuality are simply symptomatic yeah. of something deeper down. So thank you for, I think that's been a very helpful. Um, now I got one question here. Um, you know, you had suggested that pornography is common in the church as well, which is borne out by many statistics yeah. out there as well too. But how is it recognized and how is it confronted? That's the question that, that came up here. What would you, how would you answer that, Jim? Um, that's a very good question because it is, uh, it is a very hideable sin. I mean, we have, we have people who, who live a double life for decades and, and then suddenly they get caught and it comes mm -hmm. out and, right. and, you know, marriages are destroyed because the wife is saying, who are you? Who is this? What, have, what has this whole life been? So, you know, it's, it's possible to hide this. And, you know, we all have where my phone is. We all have uh, New Orleans Bourbon Street in our pocket here or, or worse. We have the whole world of pornography in our pocket if we want it. And, and um, ultimately, if someone wants to keep this hidden, they can do it for a long time. And I think if our, uh, our culture of our church is very easily and I think understandably tends towards a everybody look good type of mm -hmm. mentality, I, I, it's easy to bash that, but I think it's just almost impossible not to, not to be there because we're, we don't bear our souls all the time. But in this everybody look good type of, of culture, it is possible to hide this. Um, sometimes a wife will know. Uh, a wife will, will know there's just problems. Uh, there's uh, maybe ways that demands are placed on her that uh, mm. she's uncomfortable with. And these may be demands that are because the, the man is being taught a, a, a sexual worldview that is a pornographic sexual worldview where it's, it's all about his pleasure and she is just a pawn or a tool uh, to, to produce his pleasure experience. And she's sensing this. She doesn't feel loved. She doesn't, she doesn't feel heard. She's, she feels, in a sense, she feels abused and she is being abused. And those kinds of things, uh, the problem with that is that that also is not something that women are very quick to share uh, because they're ashamed. They're ashamed of their own their own marriage, you know, their marriage sex life. Who's, who are they, who are they going to talk to about that? Unless they have, unless they have a, a, a fellowship with other women that is, that is deep enough and real enough that gets beyond the just looks good. And they're willing to talk with each other, not bashing their husbands, but trying to, uh, to help each other grow in the Lord. And another sister hears this and says, there's something else going on. And then, you know, there could be marital counseling or something where it finally is coaxed out and, and discovered. So there's ways to see it there. But other than that, I think we need to pray uh, that people would, would come of their own accord. The best way, even in terms of the experience of repentance, by far the best way for someone to come into the light is that they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they're coming forward and saying, I want to put this to death. I'm tired of it. I want to bring it to Christ. And, and that's the way that's going to be most successful. If they're, if they're caught, we discover them and we, and we confront them. We never, it's always difficult to know to what extent is this true repentance and to what extent are they just reacting to the circumstances and the, the consequences that are crashing down upon them. So Again, we, we end up coming back down to prayer and being ready to help them. In your personal testimony to that very fact, you know, yeah. impression, the impression of the law upon somebody never brings genuine repentance, but it's that work of the spirit. Yeah. And continually reminding us again that, yeah, this is, this is a matter of prayer. It's not simply just getting the right formula together. Right. But being there. No, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, and I will add that the culture of grace that, that preaches not culture war, but preaches that there's gospel hope for this type of sin. 
that is the kind of preaching that draws that that the spirit uses to draw people to Christ and bring people to a pastor saying, I want to be done with this. I want that gospel hope. Help me. Speaks to the heart of the believer. You know, someone else asked a question here about um, about leaders anyway, you know, right? Um, leaders are struggling with themselves. So uh, how vulnerable can a leader be about their own journey with sexual sin or dysfunction? So, so leaders are struggling with these things. Um, I've known leaders that have borne their soul in front of the congregation, you know, up in the pulpit and stuff. Um, and often that doesn't have, you know, th th that blows up often. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, how would you, how would you address that? Yeah, it's, it's a great, great question. And I would say, um, I, I think we more often have erred on the side of wanting our leaders to give an impression that they don't struggle with sin anymore. Mm. And so I don't want to, we don't want to err on that side. I think it's very healthy, even in preaching, it's very healthy to say, at least in a general way, I still struggle with sin. I still have to apply the gospel every day. I still have to address heart desires and heart idols and wrong thinking. I have to do this. I need the scriptures to do this. And even whatever the point is in the particular sermon to say, this is, this is something that I have to work on too. Um, as far as specifics, that, that's probably not helpful. It's not helpful for anybody necessarily to say specifics of their sin to everyone. But pastors need to have a, a fellowship community. They need to have other peers, other pastors, elders, who they, whom they can know and they can, who can know them at those deeper levels of struggle so that they can, uh, they can keep making progress. And then, you know, then the question comes up, well, what if, what if the level of someone, of a pastor's struggle when he's with other pastors, he, he bears his soul and the level of that struggle is such that maybe it disqualifies him from his, from his position. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, well, he's going to lose his job. He's going to have to find, you know, all this. but we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ and his soul. And if that is the case, then he needs to take a break for his soul, for his family's sake, for the, for the glory of Christ. And, and there's, you know, the longer we push that aside and think that we're going to preserve our position and our salary or whatever it is, uh, the, the more we are playing Russian roulette with God's people. And, you know, we're seeing, we constantly see in the news where that is, that battle is lost and it blows up. It's a much worse, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, right. um, et cetera. There's just another news story I saw today about a pastor yep. in Indiana. We, this, there is, there is no, <laughs> there's no consideration that should be higher than the spiritual consideration of your spiritual health and therefore the health of the people that God has put under your care. So mm -hmm. don't, we shouldn't take it lightly. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a, a, such an important reminder. You know, we're, we're, we're naturally oriented to ourselves. Yeah. And so we naturally are oriented to our own success and our own pride and our own glory. And this is, this is the church of Christ that we're here to serve. And so for pastors and for church leaders and such, and, and many of this group is that, you know, that yeah. we're in those positions and yeah. uh, it, it's so easy to, to make it about ourselves as we yeah. go along this journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I should say, I know of stories, I know of stories of pastors who have said, they've come to their session, they've confessed to their wife, confessed to their um, consistory, little Presbyterianism coming out there <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> That's all right. And, you know, I, I have a pornography problem, and I'm resigning, and I am going to make this number one priority. And um, after after a few years of, of rigorous fellowship and working on this, that they have, they have gained a level of sanctification and victory where they were restored to their ministry and are far better pastors now than they ever were before sure. because they've done that and their ministry has power and they're actually able to help those who are struggling much more. So it, it, this can be a happy ending. It, the gospel is a happy ending. It just may not feel good discipline doesn't always feel good at the time but it's reminding ourselves of the goal of discipline you know, the goal of discipline god's not desiring to crush us right? right 
It's the fruit yeah. of righteousness. It's the fruit of righteousness, exactly. And so, uh, and we need to be preaching that gospel to ourselves yes. every day too, as we preach it to our congregations as well. Um, just a couple of things here too. I, you said a lot of great things. I, I loved what you said about youth group, not just having the right rules. Yeah. I think so often when it comes to youth ministry, and that's where we're, we're you know, I, I know for myself, you, you sort of have the kids until they're through high school. You know, they, they come to youth group, they come to catechism, those sorts of things. Once they go off to college, they, they're, mm -hmm. they're gone. Um, do you have any specific resources for youth groups um, that, that you guys produce or that you could recommend to, to us? Because it is easy to just kind of I, mean, I, I don't want to knock purity culture and all those sorts of things. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, and I, I believe in purity, but what are some good resources to help get a gospel perspective for our youth? Yeah, I, there is, uh, we have a book that's designed for uh, a disc, kind of a Bible study youth group lesson book uh, called Alive, mm. A-L-I-V-E, and that that's uh, designed for that purpose. Um, I would also say there's a uh, there's an organization called Axis, Axis.org, Axis.org is the website. Um, they have a lot of, uh, on, on many, many topics, but also on sexuality, what they call conversation starters. Um, I think it's a subscription service, but it's worth doing where you would, you would show a, a particular video to a youth group and then have discussion on the basis of it. Um, other than those things, I would say, the most important thing I would recommend is that those who are working with youth and especially parents themselves should get the book, God, You, and Sex, so that they can begin arming themselves with a positive biblical theology of sexuality. Because I think we just tell the kids the rules because that's all we know. That's all, we, that's all we've ever heard. And so we repeat it. This is the way to be a good Christian. Um, Meanwhile, the world, yep. the world is selling them constantly, and it's not just pornography that's selling it. The same, the message of pornography is the message of Disney and the message of YouTube mm -hmm. and TikTok and everything else. It, the, the message is constantly hammering them that gives them a positive theology of non-biblical sexuality. And, and that's what they're hearing and the peer pressure and everything. And so we need to be aggressive at, at trying to reach our kids and persuasively help them see the beauty of the gospel in sexuality and not shy away from it. Good. Hey, you just got a, a ringing endorsement for Access Monthly on uh, someone in the chat here too. So yeah, yeah it's, it's working for folks. So that's, thank you for that. Those are always important. We're lo always looking for that kind of stuff. And as the world is changing so rapidly around us, it feels like, I mean, I know the underlying issues are still the same, Yeah. but it's manifesting itself in ways uh, you think 10 years ago, there's so many right. words that we know today that we never would have even dreamed of 10 right. years ago. Right. Um, so this is a question, and I think you've answered this a little bit, but it gets a, a bit more specific. But it says, how do you, Harvest, equip pastors and church leaders to become a church that deals with sexual sins well um tied to this is, is do you do training for pastors conferences etc um so yeah i'll let you answer that and i got a follow-up question to that too yeah so um we're in the we're right in the middle of redesigning we have a program for that and we're in the middle of redesigning it because all of our materials are, are, are so quickly becoming antiquated <laughs> uh, we called that our partner ministry program and what it would entail is um, first, I would be in something of, an, of a consulting relationship with your leadership, helping you form what we call a prayer and planning committee, a, a group of people who are interested in this, who get together to make a priority of praying. And then once you're praying, then you start to add to that planning what this ministry is going to look like in your church and, and how you're going to address the culture. And that's the, the two ways that I try to shape what the prayer and planning committee does is basically that you know pay pay attention to the culture of your church what can you do to change the culture and what can you do to set up the redemptive ministry and we give guides we give uh, information on questions you should answer as a committee and how you should go about that i walk with the committee a little bit with that and then the goal of that is not just to end up with a structure but to end up with recruiting 
some people in your congregation that feel willing and called to do this ministry, people who are willing to, to meet one-on-one -on -one and to meet and facilitate a group. And once that, once you get to that point, then we offer a, a, a training event where uh, we mm -hmm. give you some videos to watch and then we come out and uh, train your, your team. Uh, it's usually a Friday evening and Saturday morning thing. Um, I've just described it to you and there will probably be a bunch of demand for it at this point. And there may be a long waiting list because at this point, again, we're in the middle of redesigning some of the materials. So we're doing, we're not doing as much of this as we have in the past, but I do hope to revive some form of that process. Um, for now, much of it is what I've told you and using the curriculum, what you end up using at the end of that training is the, the curricula that I showed you on the website. Um, so you can download some of that. The, the, the downloads are all free downloads. So you can look at some of those yourself and see what they look like. Um, but yeah, I, I was a little afraid of, to describe that process knowing sure. how ill-equipped I am at this moment to follow through on it. Well, I, I, it's great to hear of that kind of on the horizon or at least coming back onto the horizon, you yeah. know, because it's, you know, it's something that you had been involved with previously too but you know as a christian reformed church you know right now we're, we're dealing with you know kind of the the political theological biblical understanding of human sexuality and i know you're familiar with our, our 73 report and, and you're somewhat familiar with the, the current human sexuality report but there there's there's a daylight beyond that you know and, and that's where our churches need to be we, we don't need to be in in, in the political fight, I mean, and in, in, in all the theological fight every day. I mean, we need to have that settled so that we can get down to the, the point where we can minister with people. So I, I, I can see a, a tremendous demand, especially as this is becoming more rampant across our culture and, and within our churches. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm, let me just, I want to make sure I got other people's questions here too. I don't want to be the, I don't want to be hogging all the time here but um no i think i think we've got got some good stuff here i've, I've got a big question that i'm going to ask you but i'm going to ask you later because it but i think it's a question that we as um the christian reformed church you know back to our 73 report i mean one of the big struggles that we have right now is understanding what we mean by our current position and you're not crc so i'm not throwing this at you but I, i'd love to just hear a couple of your thoughts on the idea of orientation and desire. You know, those are two things where, you yeah. know, if you could just give me some thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, words words are, are often, in, in these conversations, very difficult to define and many people mean different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way I would describe orientation, I would, I would bring orientation to like a, a bare kernel as um, the, the particular shape of my, let's say, the, the body memory that I have of, of, of the types of things that, that particularly tempt me. Um, and I, I'm using tempt because I want to keep it somehow connected to the biblical worldview and to the issue of sin. I don't want to say that it's that it's neutral, um, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, we we don't just lose uh, the the kinds of things that tempt us, um, right. but we also we also can can find that we can grow and things that used to tempt us almost uncontrollably now they're just distractions, so to speak. You know, I'm I'm. I have a friend who's, who's, who describes it as, you know, well, what if, you know, let's just, let's say that I was a habitual um, car keyer. I liked every, I just impulsively would go by in parking lots and like to key the car, uh, you know, scratch, sc put a big scratch in it and vandalize cars. And, and I've repented of that and I'm growing against that. Um, but I still, every once in a while, when I'm walking in the parking lot, and I see the, you know, the kind of car, I see the, the Cadillac SUV, black, shiny, just the kind of car that I normally would get great destructive glee out of, out of scraping my key across. I get that sudden pull of adrenaline and, oh, 
And then I immediately address it with the gospel. Who do you think you are? Love that person. Mm -hmm. Don't love yourself. Love God. You know, and I put it to death. Um, but I say to myself, I'm still oriented to be a car keyer. I still know that weakness. So I think, you know, the, the idea of orientation, to me, it's, it's something that is helpful in as much as we're identifying the, the particular shapes of our temptations. Um, but as most of the world would see it, it's first of all neutral and not having to do with anything with God. And as something that is not only, you know, corruption, as we would say, corruption that we carry with us in this body of death, but is a, a fixed part of our personality and who we are. And therefore, not only fixed, you shouldn't, you shouldn't even in the world's terms ever try to change such an orientation. Um, if, it's, if it's an orientation towards something criminal, then of course you shouldn't act on it, but you should accept who you are and, and, and what you are. So I, that's where I would say, I'm gonna define orientation, but I'm going, to, I'm going to nuance orientation according to it being within a Christian worldview and Christian anthropology. I think that's where you're the, 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 the differentiation between the soil and the roots is helpful. Yeah. You know, and, and, and again, and then also the dichotomy between the way the world understands it and the way a biblical worldview understands desire. Desire understands the roots in the soil, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, um, I was going to, and I didn't, I didn't, but I was going to give like an example of a particular person um, that I made up out of, out of a, amalgamation of true people. Um, and it might be good for me to just to, to give that right now. Let's say that uh, we'll call him Ed, who grows up in his soil is, he's the youngest of four brothers and all his brothers are, his other brothers are to some extent into typically manly things. They're mm -hmm. on the sports teams, uh, they're achievers. Uh, one of them is a hunter, um, et cetera. Whereas Ed, part of his soil, part of what he was born with is that he's very clumsy. He's not coordinated at all. The hand-eye coordination is not there. Um, therefore, he hates sports. He's always hated sports. He hates even watching sports because it makes him feel um, like he doesn't belong. He doesn't fit. Uh, let's say when he was in fourth grade gym class, they had to, uh, a, soft, a softball unit. And the first time he threw a ball, he, he was mercifully teased for throwing like a girl. And then he got labeled and the name calling, um, maybe even sometimes getting beat up, that kind of thing. And then there's one, there's one boy, two grades above him who befriends him and who accepts him and treats him well and eventually brings him into gay porn. And the rest is history. Now you look at a lot of that as soil. A lot of that, is, a lot of the soil is, is the way he was made, is, is, is his biology, and maybe even some of his brain work. Um, understanding the complexity of, well, well, where does that, how does that interplay with how he gets to the point where he can't imagine being attracted to a woman, but men are what, turns him on and is is what makes him feel valuable loved whole like everything in the world is good again that, that, that the idea of that counterfeit um identifying where the heart is interacting with that uh we don't do that with with pointed fingers but we do it with gospel fingers saying um somewhere in there your heart is interacting somewhere we don't need to understand what and we can we can understand that there's circumstances things that happen to you as well as biology and mental um physiology because that's all biology so again i want to be complicated and nuanced and yet never letting go of the christian worldview yeah it's, it's not simplistic that's for sure and I think you've really helped us to see that again, too, in our in our ministries. It's not simplistic, but it's not as though there's no answer. Right. It's not as though there's no help. There's right. there's great hope in the gospel. That's good. Well, Jim, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. We're heading towards 4:30. Right. Thank you so much for just taking this time with us. Uh, 
I, I think for one, it, it, it connects us to a good resource that I don't know how many folks were, were familiar with Harvest USA, hopefully more are, but in other organizations that, that are doing similar work to Harvest USA, but, but they're out there and there, there, is, there is help for churches, there's help for leaders, there's help for us as we're struggling with these same things as well too. So thank you for being here. I think this, is, this has been very practical and very helpful and blessings to you on your ministry. Yeah. Thank you, Chad. It's a joy to give back to the CRC. Hey, we're glad to have you back in. We're going to rope you in just a little bit here. So glad to have you, but blessings on your work in Pittsburgh. And um, I'm going to close us in prayer and then, um, then we'll be sending everybody on their way. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time. And we, we thank you that the gospel message is deep and rich and reaches down to the core of our very being. And Lord, how could it not be so with you at work um, through your son and through his work on the cross, but by your spirit as it's being brought and applied into our hearts. So we thank you, Lord, that uh, this work reaches deep, but it's also a work that reaches very practically into our lives. And so, Father, we do pray for, for those as we minister to those who are struggling sexually, even maybe those on this Zoom call, too, that as we struggle with these things, too, that, Lord, you would bring us to conviction in the depth of our being, but Lord, that practically the gospel would bring us great hope and that Lord, you'd restore us and transform us and mold us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for Harvest USA and I pray for Jim's ministry there too, that you would help them. And especially as they're revamping some of the ways they're, they're connecting with churches, we pray Lord that that would be effective, that you'd give them wisdom and wherewithal as they update materials and Lord, we pray that your church would be willing and ready to engage and to proclaim the good news of Christ, and that we would be confident and that we would stand on the sufficiency of the gospel. We pray this in the name of our sure and strong Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, everyone, as you're uh, taking off out of here, just a reminder, come back in a couple of weeks. June 7 in the evening, we're going to have prayer together, and then Synod starts on June 10. Um, yeah, that's always, that's been a big focus for us, but again, there's much life after that. And so we're thankful for that. And that life is held in the hands of our Lord and Savior. So everyone have a great day and blessings. Thanks again, Jim.